everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe. I'm the host and producer of the Chats, which are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today, I'm sitting down for an interview with Richard Leather. He's the first Mr. Leather Wales, and that was in 2016, also the first runner-up to Mr. Leather West 2015. Currently, Richard is the president of Leatherman Camry. How are you, Richard? I'm good, thank you, Keith. So, how are things in Wales today? Um, yeah, it's all good here. Um, today is a nice sunny day, it's been, um, and yeah, looking forward to um, having a chat this evening. Fantastic. So, let's start right at the very beginning. Tell us a little bit about where you're from and your growing up years. Well, well I grew up um, here in Wales, um, closer to Swansea than um, Cardiff, I, I grew up. And sort of um, there, I sort of grew up with my my mum, my dad, and my brother and two sisters. And um, yeah, I sort of really enjoyed my time um, in a, a small town called um, Neath in, here in Wales. Did you have any concept about homosexuality or fetish when you were growing up? Um, well, it's one of the questions that I got asked um, being sort of, um, sort of going in for being uh, a mister was when or what was your first sort of um, piece of leather or where do you recall um, sort of that interest into sort of fetish or what have you? And I start out sort of thinking back to my time as um, a child around sort of eight or nine in the 80s um, when growing up and sort of the pop era and there was sort of then the leather ties and sort of the slim leather ties and growing up is what I wanted. I wanted sort of um, a leather tie and I had um, a bright pink cerise um, leather tie and a grey one. Um, so that's really my first sort of recollection of um, sort of fetish or leather wear um, as such. Um, and then, so going on is when then sort of going into employment uh, and that having finished school, uh, I, one of the first things I wanted was um, to be able to afford to buy really a um, leather jacket. So I invested my money um, wisely in buying um, a leather jacket and, and that is what I wanted. So from that, I think obviously there was um, really an interest there in leather. May not really understood um, what leather was. Um, bikers and all of that interest um, sort of growing up but really sort of into being sort of um, gay or what have you well that was later on in life for myself um, I didn't sort of um, come out um, as being sort of a gay man until really I was 27 um, so a lot later in sort of um, sort of life rather than sort of being that sort of early teenage sort of um, years and that. And that is really sort of where then my sort of taking up being sort of gay and thinking, well, I don't sort of recognize going to the clubs and bars and what have you in Wales. When you see the drag queens, I really didn't fit into that element. And the interest there grew around sort of fetish and leather was where I felt a little bit more comfortable um, in men being more manly in, in their appearance. Let's take a step back. Tell me how you felt wearing the leather ties. Um, it was the in thing, it was what was happening, but it really gave um, sort of that image, the sort of confidence and what have you in the school discourse and and what have you. So really sort of enjoyed wearing really my um, leather tie at the time. Did you feel excited? Oh, definite. Um, always just having that first piece of leather and being able to go and buy it was exciting. It was really exciting just to go and buy a piece of leather that I owned and it was what I wanted. So the feel, the touch, 
um, even at a young age, um, was really sort of, um, yeah, really exciting to, to be able to own a piece of leather. Tell me what you were thinking and feeling when you acquired your jacket. Oh, that, I mean, the actual sort of thinking, well, this is what I wanted. I wanted a leather jacket. I wanted that actual sort of, um, in essence, it was more what I felt comfortable in. It wasn't sort of um, seeing other guys, bikers and all of that is what I wanted. I wanted that look. I wanted to feel in it and having that on, wearing, um, yeah, I felt... Um, a lot more grown up and sort of feeling, yeah, I'm much more now becoming a man in essence, um, having sort of bought my, my leather jacket as well. Do you still have it? I don't. Sadly, I don't. That's one thing I, I don't have. Um, sort of, and I would have been sort of definitely have grown out of it um, by now anyway. So, How did you even know about sort of that leather look what was your first introduction to that well i think um sort of with uh, tv programs and what have you um you had the um sort of american sort of programs on where you had the police bikers and all of that um sort of seeing all of that it's the understanding well i like that look it's something i like um is i think what drew sort of me then towards um that is something that actual sort of and, and seeing bikers and, and that around as well you said you came out sort of as a leather man at age 27. what was your life prior to that before sort of coming out um being gay um even i mean I was very much um, straight and going to nightclubs and all of that element, but not on um, gay community, really. It was all the straight community and sort of dated a few girls and, and that as well, um, but never really felt comfortable enough to actually commit um, to, to anyone. Um, still sort of liked my freedom and been able to be who I am but suddenly that realization is well I don't know if this is really me and then saying to myself well okay is it and looking at guys um I know when I was younger going through sort of the catalog um of seeing or magazines seeing guy in in underwear and what have you had an attraction um, and it's that sort of thinking, well, really is me being an attract or have an attraction to men um, that I was thinking, well, OK, let's go on to explore then that side um, rather than sort of the straight community. How did you come out into the leather scene at age 27? Well, it was a little bit later, um, not much later than uh, when I first sort of um, came out as being gay. That oh, I, uh, I then um, met a, a guy, and that's where I moved um, from near Swansea to Cardiff. And well, one evening, we just decided to go uh, to visit Bristol and parties in a different sort of gay um, scene to Swansea or Cardiff, something a bit um, different. And there we went um, for a meal, we went to a couple of the gay bars and we just decided what, um, to, we were gonna head on to um, a nightclub, a gay nightclub on a Wednesday evening. Um, just didn't think any more than we were going to disco party and um, parked up the car, went to sit for a drink and ended back at the club. We paid, went into the um, club and as soon when we got through into the bar, it wasn't um, the disco night. Um, my first reaction was, I'm in a fetish bar. Straight away, um, it was a fetish night that they held in the bar once a month. And that was my first stumble, really, by accident into the fetish world. And it really sort of, that first initial reaction was, am I safe in this venue? That was the first thing what I was concerned on is 
knowing was I safe. So it took me a while just to adjust to the environment, had a drink, settled myself down with my partner. And that realization that, yes, we were safe. No one had come on to us. No, nobody had sort of dragged us off and tied us up. Um, even though there were guys tied to benches, there were guys um, in um, cages and, and that um, being played with, we were safe. We were there. And it was that sort of ability to go explore at our own pace and what we were comfortable with. And that really got my sort of thoughts is, yeah, I quite like and feel comfortable. I want to be involved in some of this play that's gone on and stood and observed and took in um, a lot of that information of what was happening and seeing then thinking, OK, I want to go and try some of this myself. So back at, at home, as you do behind the closed doors, you start to explore some of these um, sort of areas of fetish and finding what you're comfortable with. And um, yeah, it was really from there, um, the journey started really um, into um, a life of enjoying um, the fetish um, sort of scene. But upon walking into that club, did you have any idea about this fetish scene? Did you even know anything about it? I must have known something because the first words was, this is a fetish event. So I think um, looking at magazines and internet and what have you, you stumble across sort of porn or what have you, where some of this is, and you start to have that realization of what is fetish, but never really encountered it in a real life situation. That was the first um, encounter. So there, I must have understood or had an inkling because the first words were, this is a fetish event. After you felt a little more comfortable in the mm -hmm. venue, what fetishes in that situation did you find the most appealing? Um, I quite liked um, bondage. Um, and that is something that really intrigued me, the actual sort of um, restraint and that ability to just um, sort of then allow someone else to then um have a little bit of control um it's not something i'm i'm comfortable in giving other people um control it tends to i'm quite sort of um a person that likes to sort of just have a little bit of the reins um on things and and again it challenges you on on that to hand that over to someone else and for me a lot of the time um is that i give out rather than and um, sort of have done to myself but again it's still that exploring some of the sort of um, enjoyment around um, bondage and sort of also seeing sort of again the sort of guys being sort of um, whipped and, and what have you as well um, in there intrigued me and also electro play um, they were doing and the ability to stimulate um, a guy uh, with um, electrodes and uh, just put in a pulsation um, there was um, definitely something that sort of interests me and intrigued me in, in finding more on sort of the ability to enjoy um, that play with, with someone. So in this club, conversely, if you found things there that you did enjoy and were titillating, were there things going on that you found awful, off-putting, Terrifying. Um, well, yeah, there were guys being um, fisted um, in the venue. And first off, that sort of thinking, mm, I'm not quite certain on that um, element of, of play. And um, even now, um, I'm quite wary in going into that play, um, especially sort of exploring it with someone new. I'm not adverse to sort of um, sort of fisting a, a, a guy or what have you, but again, for me is um, being more um, a top, and then I want to enjoy 
um, a sort of fucking a guy um, compared to then um, fisting. So I keep off um, unless they regular um, being fisted. I try not to go into that play um, too much. What other activities did you find in Bristol? Within the sort of um, club in, in Bristol, they sort of, as I said, run this on a sort of monthly basis. And again, it continued on in Bristol to sort of the actual fetish scene um, then became to socials and, and that as well, understanding that they done a social event so got quite involved really in Bristol with the social environment um, or with the other fetish guys um, separate events that we would go sort of um, through to and enjoy that social element as well as sort of the play um, element um, on it and even sort of um, on different events that um, started sort of springing up uh, across the city there in Bristol on one of them, we went to was uh, done a class and to teach you how to um, do bondage and, and what have you as well. It was always um, quite interesting, seeing a lot of different styles and types of fetish play um, into breath control. And again, the sort of guys in various different um, fetishes, rubber, um, lycra, sportswear, um, leather, um, started to start to see some um, pups um, coming on board as, as well in that sort of um, period of time um, happening in, in Bristol, yes. What did, you, what did you discover about yourself in that situation? I, for me, it was really that exploring the actual sort of what I enjoyed um, in fetish and the actual sort of reality of well this is really who I am um, I'm much more into this play um, I like a little bit of variety I like to um, try stuff new and um, that is really understanding really um, exactly the sort of things I was comfortable with and the play that I wanted to get involved um, into. But it also, it grew, I think, there in sort of for myself is wanting to really be much more involved in the LGBT um, sort of scene as well. Um, and there it prompted me um, to open an LGBT um, business um, here in Cardiff. Um, I had a um, sauna and gym um, and that had it for a short period of time. It just didn't really um, take off. But it was that actual sort of thinking I wanted to give something to um, the sort of um, LGBT community as well. So um, became a, a businessman um, in the sort of uh, um, scene here in Cardiff. Why did you choose a sauna and gym as opposed to another business? We only had one um, sauna um, here in the um, city and it wasn't always where people wanted to, to go. So exploring um, Jess Belt and doing sort of speaking with other sort of venues and, and that around the UK, other saunas, was felt that it was something to branch out into. Um, I think the combination of the both just wasn't sort of uh, the right concept. Um, at the time um, but again it was the sort of um, ability to offer something different. You said it only lasted a short time? Yes so again um, I was still working full-time my um, <clears throat> partner at the time was running the business um, but again sort of finances and all of that um, if you've got sort of little coming in a lot going out is that balancing with the business and the right just we decided then um to sort of move on and sort of do um some something um, completely unrelated then what did you ultimately do <clears throat> so um as i said i was continued working uh at 
I do now is uh, doing the same job. I've been in so the same, same employer um, for 20 years um, and that. So my partner then went more into um, back into his um, sort of stream of work in being a engineer. So went back into engineering um, and that so is where then things went on from, from there. Tell us how your journey in the leather community continued. So for me, it then in Bristol continued um, picking back up um, there in being involved in the scene uh, and that in, in Bristol. And with it is being sort of involved with sort of a little bit with Leather West. Um, at the time, they um, created the group, a few guys um and we had nothing in wales wales there had never been any sort of fetish or leather or anything like that club or scene at all at pure in wales everything was um geared in in bristol and compared i mean bristol's only what 45 minutes away um by car um sort of from cardiff it's quite easy to um get a, a car load of people and head over yes so we would quite regularly just journey over to to Bristol and start again involved in the um, scene then being sort of um, going to um, Darklands in Antwerp and what have you with uh, sort of Leather West um, being on their stand and talking about sort of leather and um, sort of fetish and what have you and then they sort of um, done a Mr Leather West um, competition and I was thinking, oh, do I stand for it? Do I not? And uh, decided um, to actually enter into the uh, Mr. Leather West um, competition. And on the evening, there was five contestants. Oh. And um, I then became the first um, runner up um, of that um, actual competition. Over that period of time, um, 2015 into 2016, um, it became knowledge um, here in the UK that um, the practices really of Leather West wasn't fully sort of um, what we really knew and understood that the title of Mr. Leather UK, they had gone and trademarked it back in 2013. And... Um, with that, they started to say that they had ownership of this title and it was being run in, in London um, and that. And this became sort of that title uh, a period of time, really, where um, it caused a lot of um, upset and actually sort of groups just didn't like um, and want to be associated, really, with um, Leather West at all. So with it again in the build-up, we had events sort of starting then um, in Cardiff um, as Leather Social started. And with that, we decided that we wanted to do a lot more here in Cardiff. Um, being the capital of Wales, um, there'd been nothing. Most of the guys that would head over to Bristol were here um, in Wales. Out of the five guys, that entered into Mr. Leather West. Um, the actual four of them were here from here in South Wales. Um, so with that, there was a core of um, leather fetish guys um, really here in, in, in Wales. And we, number of us decided at the time we wanted to do a lot more. Um, and the leather social crew, we started then to go into the pride parade um here in cardiff and that started attracting a lot more people into the um city and wanting events so from that natural venue the eagle bar in cardiff they decided um that they wanted a mr leather wales um in 2016 and i wasn't really going to enter into the competition and on the actual weekend they were holding it, I was at um, a wedding um, up in Yorkshire um, about 
four and a half hour drive away from Cardiff. And we were asked by the um, husband of um, our friend who um, sort of was getting married. He asked if we would stay on the Sunday because he had a surprise for his, his partner. And they were um, an helicopter was going to land in the hotel to take them off on their honeymoon. So we waited until lunchtime, just after lunch, for all of this to happen. And was, time was getting sort of tight and we were thinking, OK, we head back home. But we, my partner and I, at the time, we discussed on the way back. We had leathers with us and we decided to call into the services, change into our leathers and head to the actual social event um, that was happening and the Mr. Leather Wales competition. When I was there, the proprietor, who I knew quite well from my days of um, having the LGBT business and that I knew quite well and the socials and all of that, um, just came on to me and said, well, Rich, why don't you um, stand for Mr. Leather Wales? So I am denied and decided, OK, give me the application form and just filled it out briefly and handed it in. And there was five of us who sort of then stood for uh, Mr. Leather Wales in 2016. And with it, I always had this passion. I wanted to do something here in Wales with uh, the leather fetish community. So I didn't really think much of it. Um, I went through the competition and then the sort of time for the results to be announced. And there on that night being announced the winner um, the first Mr. Leather Wales. So for me, it was then, okay, what do I do? I've got a title. What does that mean? My desire, I want to see more happen. So over that year, um, it challenged me um, in many different ways. Um, being in work, um, I wasn't really out in work. So in the August of uh, 2016, I led um, at the front of Cardiff um, Pride. And I was thinking, well, if you can do that, why aren't you the same in work? And decided to actually be open and honest um, about my sexuality to um, my work colleagues and became then the, um, in early 2017, the actual sort of um, LGBT staff network lead for, for Wales, for my organisation. And um, again, grew um, the biggest um, staff organisation for our uh, sort of staff network for our organisation um, here in, in Wales, myself and um, a colleague of mine. And that really sort of helped me sort of on sort of my journey, really um, being and doing stuff in Wales. But then there was, as I said, there was no club or nothing um, here. Uh, I'd been involved with the biking scene as well with my uh, partner at the time, um, the gay biking scene in, in the UK. I decided then I wanted to start a leather fetish club um, here. So I sat, sat down, talked her over with a couple of the other guys and decided it was the right thing really to do. So I started the actual um, Leatherman um, Cam Camry. And with that, in 20, late 2016, 20, um, 2017, is where we've seen the birth of the actual sort of leather fetish club. And with that, then over the period of time, go into different events um, across um, the UK and into Europe, um, is then the understanding that there are other clubs out there. There are other leather and fetish clubs who are part of the um, ECMC, the European Confederation of Motorcycle Clubs. So explore, started to explore during my title year, um, the other clubs touring um, the, both the UK and into um, Europe um, as a, a mister. And then sort of the desire to take the club into being something uh, connected to something bigger, a bigger family of um, our leather fetish community. So with that, um, it started the actual um, application process um, to become a full member club of the um, ECMC. 
Tell and us more about that. How how do you do that? So first off, you have to um, state to the actual organization that you are a club, that you have members, you have a constitution, and that you are holding events, you are operational. So you, the sort of at the, the time um, when the other guys and went to their um, AGM event. Um, it was held at, that year in Amsterdam and declared that we are a club um, in, in here in Wales. We started it, we have members, we have a constitution. And then sort of over that year is you then constantly sort of um, trying to build the actual sort of um, club um, up then you need to apply for probationary membership as a club. So I went and to um, Paris, to the AGM in Paris and presented the club um, to the members, um, the member clubs of the ECMC and with it sort of um, just showcasing what we had done. And um, during that year as a club, we made a, a big stand um, that year against um, a backlash that we had here in Wales, where we had a um, pride event tell us that we weren't welcome as leather and fetish men at their pride. And we had to remind them that what pride was um, about. And the support that we gained um, across um, the world really um, was astronomical. And it even um, we had a member of our parliament, our UK parliament, stand up in the, um, the chamber in Westminster to say that this had happened in his constituency and that he was supportive of us being involved um, in Pride and what Pride was um, truly about. And I never dreamt at all that we would have that influence even within the UK Parliament um, as a group when we started. But then from that, we went on then in um, Italy in 2019 to then apply for um, full membership. So you continue on and you apply for full membership. It goes to the clubs of the ECMC to then vote you um, in to and be a full member club as well. Um, and yeah, I'm pleased to say, as you can see, we are now full members um, of the ECMC. And we sort of have now gone on to um, support other clubs, Leathermen of Scotland, uh, to come um, into the um, ECMC. And we work very closely with them. So it's good to, that we are seeing really clubs, leather fetish clubs, starting to come back really here in the, the UK. And um, for a long time, we were starting seeing sort of clubs close. Um, older guys in the clubs, the clubs were dying um, out. Um, but we are starting to see the change. We now have um, sort of four sort of ECMC member clubs and we are working with other groups um, in the um, UK to become members of the ECMC and also other sort of smaller groups to um, think about where they are, when they are meeting is being sort of a um, true member club, not just an events organization. We have um, in the UK a number of cities where they just have event organizations uh, are not truly a member club. And this is where we are wanting to really bring back um, that sort of essence of belonging to something, actually sort of being able to enjoy um, the fellowship and friendship um, that we have um, as being sort of part of um, a actual leather fetish um, club. What do you think has caused this resurgence? I think some of it is that um, we have very segregated groups, I think, in the, especially here in the UK. Um, we have a lot of the sort of, um, we have the leather groups, 
We have um, those who are into their rubber in, with rubber groups. We have the pups who are in pup groups. We don't have them actually really integrated um, with each other. Very few events where they actually sort of combine um, some of these um, events and some of these older clubs. I think for some of the younger community mem members of our community, I think they see us as being old, they're not relevant, they're not up to date and don't attract to them. Um, and therefore, I think sometimes the puppy scene has actually sort of um, been much more attractive to, to um, the actual sort of younger element. I think it's sometimes the play element and sometimes the costing as well around it. And I think that is sort of for us to have, I think, a much, I would like to see um, some of these groups come together and work together a lot more in holding events that are um, for everyone in fetish and not just sort of, um, okay, the leather guys have theirs, the pups have their events and the rubber guys have theirs, that we actually work together to bring about an all fetish um, event that um, allows everyone to um, come together and, and enjoy whatever fetish um, they're into. What is your current membership? So currently we have um, around um, 50 members um, to the club. So we're not a big club. We don't expect to be. Um, being, what, 3 million adults in, in Wales, um, we don't expect to have a big um, club um, here. We're not gone out for that. We just want to be um, sort of a community that <clears throat> work together and actually support one another and have events that we can actually sort of um, go out to in our leather um, or fetish where we want to be able to um, give people that ability to come out in, in their fetish. Are you succeeding in being able to do that? We are. Um, we have started um, different events um, here in Cardiff. We've gone into um, Swansea as well, our second city here in Wales. And again, it's that sort of bit by bit growing the club and seeing new people come on board. And again, on the our sort of club website, we sort of show um, a film called The Lives of um, a Leatherman. And that came about because of um, a student who was from um, studying here in Cardiff, was in Europe spoke to and Kate or stumble across really um, the Mr. Leather Europe at the time, Joe King, and had a conversation with him about sort of leather and fetish. And in his studies, he needed to create um, a film about something. And it was an idea for him to actually then create um, sort of uh, and do an interview about um, the leather um, community. So for that was a real sort of ability to showcase really what a life of Leatherman is. Um, we had a younger lad coming into um, sort of the fetish scene. We had, um, we know as Daddy Ian here in the uh, UK from Manchester, talk yes. about his experience as an older um, leather guy and what that meant to him and the changes that he'd seen over the period of time and myself as, as a mister. What does that mean? Where does it all come from? And bit by bit is we've started to see the community here um, in Cardiff grow. We're now seeing we have a vibrant puppy um, community here. We have um, a rubber community is just starting to take off here and a club has started to sort of appear here for um, our, our rubber sort of uh, friends as well. And also we started to sort of see our events are becoming much more popular um, than they were, much more attendance at um, our social events um, in Cardiff. And again, sort of working to actually sort of um, branch out to 
everyone really of all ages and that is what is i quite enjoy is seeing that we do have people attending of all ages um and they if they have leather if they don't have leather um they welcome to the social and again for me is the importance really of our attraction is do we only welcome people in if they've got certain leather or again do they look in a certain way and for myself i just sort of um, went down the route of anyone is welcome if you've got leather or not you're welcome to our social and we had one guy who came to the social for at least a, a year or more did never never ever wore um, leather at all we turned up one day at the social and he just completely surprised us in wearing some biker leather that he um, had actually been able to afford to, to buy. And turned up with his bag, changed in the venue, then unchanged um, and walked um, back to get his bus home. And over the period of time, we suddenly started seeing that he would, um, he had a little bit more leather and then he would sort of, uh, walk sort of then out to the venue in a little bit of leather uh, to the point of now he gets on the bus for leathers comes to the actual sort of um, social walks through Cardiff back home in his full leathers and it's that nurturing as well of people like that to explore really what they are feeling comfortable in as well and it gives me the a great pleasure when I've, I've been able to um, see um, members of our community um, who are into rubber or into um, <laughs> sort of leather or pap um, actually explore that, um, being able to come and ask us the questions and have the advice and, and what have you as well. When we were preparing for this interview, you mentioned that uh, there's been some difficulty among the various factions in the UK. Would you tell us a little bit about that, please? So, as I said, I mean, the actual sort of um, title of Mr. Leather UK, um, that argument and discussion really has not gone away. Um, only quite recently uh, have we started to have that conversation again um, here in the UK about the actual title and the name of that title. Um, we don't see it um, really from Wales. We have our own Mr. We don't see Mr. Leather UK really represents um, our people here in Wales. Speaking with um, our friends um, of Leatherman Scotland, they were feeling the same. It just didn't represent um, them either. So the organizing um, company that owns the title of Mr. Leather UK um went out for consultation um a public consultation on uh, the, the actual title and as clubs we wanted to have a discussion with the organizing company and on it we made our point very clear that from wales we wouldn't get involved in um, the title of mr leather uk scotland as i said we're feeling the same as us um we see it more um, a title of Mr. Leather England. Um, when we've looked at the history of the people who have won Mr. Leather UK, they're actually they've represented England. Um, quite a lot of the time it has been held in England, um, London, Bristol, um, Birmingham. Um, it really hasn't come from that. So we are sort of still this sort of point of okay we haven't fully stepped back but at the moment we said at this time we won't be getting involved um again for ireland um being part of the united kingdom um it's the same thing we can never and i i mean i may be wrong but i can't see someone from ireland actually wearing um a mr leather uk sash i think from Northern Ireland, um, they sort of look to the Republic of Ireland and do a lot with them um, down in um, Dublin and with um, 
um, Leatherman of Ireland. And again, we think that they would want to weigh um, Mr. Leather Island and um, Sash rather than someone from Northern Ireland wearing uh, Mr. Leather UK. And it's the same a little bit here mm -hmm. in Wales. We do have people, um, especially in West Wales and North Wales, would be unlikely to want to wear a Mr. Leather UK um, sash. They will be very happy in wearing a Mr. Leather Wales because that is who they represent. That is where their heart is. And that is what we are seeing here at the moment here in the UK is that the sort of title of Mr. Leather UK, we think should um, really be known as Mr. Leather and um, England. And also we have, as I said uh, previously, we have a lot of organizations that do events and they aren't got any membership um, to them at all. And there's a still a lot of discussion around that. What we have found is some of these companies have gone ahead and trademarked certain titles here in the UK. So for us, in Wales, we can't really run a Mr. Puppy Wales because the word Mr. Puppy is trademarked here. And that really, to me, is what are we trying to um, sort of gain from trademarking titles? Who really owns a title? We've always declared the ownership of Mr. Leather Wales. It's not the Eagle. It's not Leatherman Camry. It is the actual leather community themselves. They're the people that select the person that they feel should be their ambassador. And therefore, I think that is where really the title um, should be and continue to be, no matter um, then who wants to actually and run that actual um, competition. <laughs> so there's still a lot of debate and discussion going on around some of the actual sort of organization and, and that of different um, titles um, here in, in the UK. Do you think you'll succeed with the Mr. Leather England shift? Um, we hope so. Um, we are still working with it and with different groups, London Leathermen, Manchester Leathermen, Leathermen South. Um, there's also a group in, in Leeds um, and a group in Birmingham that are starting to sort of develop there. And we're hoping that is where they truly will see that really England need their own title. Yes, I'd be happy if they wanted to be still known as Mr. Leather UK, but the actual sort of underneath that, what it represents really are the leather guys and uh, fetish guys in, in um, England rather than from um, the other countries or that make up the United Kingdom. Where do you see Leatherman Camry in about five to 10 years? So for me um, is where I want to see it go and grow is being able to meet really sort of um, all fetish really across both sort of the gay, um, lesbian, al al trans and all of that. I mean, for me, I've got back to sort of um, Swansea Pride in 2019 as an, a, a group. Leatherman Camry, we had, were in the parade. We had a stander at the actual sort of um, uh, Pride event. And myself and my partner, we were walking around. I was, had my leathers, full leathers uh, and that on. And just stumbled across a um, health um, stand um, that were um, there at the event. And I wear two hats, as I said. Um, I also in work um, the lead for our staff network um, here in Wales. So started to engage and talk to um, a group of um, trans men on um, one of the stands and got to find out that they were actually um, boot blacks. Oh. And for me, it was that thinking, why do I not know about you? 
they were from West Wales and and that I hadn't heard or knew about them at all. They'd never been to any of our events and they never knew anything about us. They knew nothing about the um, fetish and leather um, community um, within the LGBT um, sort of um, network or on sort of community at all. And realizing that they were going to straight events, um, straight fetish events um, in Swansea and South Wales. And from that is that um, ability to have that discussion about the different events, um, sort of Darklands in um, Antwerp, and knowing there they just had um, Boot Black Europe competition um, that year and was able to share some of that with uh, the, the two guys from um, down in um, West Wales. And talking to, um, and some of you may have already have seen, um, Alistair um, was one of the actual sort of guys that was on the, the stand and sharing really um, about um, boot black. And I'd seen it around in different events in London and um, across in, in Europe, but not here in Wales. And from that is where then Al Alistair went to um, Darklands and uh, became Boot Black Europe. Yes. And that for me is where I want to see the, the club grow in people understanding what our community here in Wales um, we have what interest people have, the ability to um, come and fellowship and enjoy the social element of things and see in that grow um, people being who they want to be and the freedom to be able to do what they want to do. Here in Wales, we're very restricted on play in um, LGBT venues. Um, bars and what have you we are not allowed to do any of that we can't have that um, in our bars and therefore we don't have a safe environment for people to really play in and that is something really I want to see happen the change happen that we can have safe spaces here in Wales where people can come and actually um, explore their fetish like I did when I stumbled across the bar in Bristol and seeing the play and knowing it's a safe environment to be able to explore and understand really and have the knowledge passed on to me on what is safe play, how to play correctly. Um, that is what I want to be able to see happen um, here. I'm working with um, the Eagle Bar to see what we can do um, in the future in being able to offer um, really some form of safe space for people to actually come and explore um, really their fetish um, in an environment that they feel comfortable in and are able to actually um, then explore it. How about a private dungeon space? Yeah, it could well be is sort of having, like I know in London they do have that um, compared to other major cities in the UK, um, we seem to be quite a way back here in Wales on the ability to allow that to happen. And it is that challenging of our local authority to be able to offer some of these spaces um, up. So it could well be a private dungeon space. Um, we have tried events in different venues. I think people like the social element as well as the play element. So trying to get that balance really of um, an environment that people feel comfortable in, that they can explore. Um, and, and that is, I think, having it in a bar may be a better environment. But um, again, I'd say a dungeon space could well be um, that perfect um, sort of opportunity to, to hold something um, in. What advice? Can you afford people who are new to the community? I think for me um, is do not be put off um, really by how harsh some of the actual sort of um, look of things are when you first encounter it. 
go and explore for yourself. Don't be put off. But to play safe, gain the advice from those who are doing this play, learn from them, I think is a real sort of um, key element um, on some of this is there's a vast amount of knowledge that lots of people have who are willing to share that with you and yeah, go and explore and enjoy um, the, the life really of, of fetish. How do you want to be remembered by your community? For me is what I want to be remembered for is, yeah, when he stood up on that stage as Mr. Leather Wales competition, and he said he wanted to see the change and leave a legacy of fetish here in Wales. That is what I'd love them to remember me by. What's the biggest misconception about you? I think for me, um, a lot of people find me um, quiet um, and that really I don't get involved in things. I may be a bit, little bit standoffish as far as what they may see, but uh, if they really get to know me, then they'll see a completely different side to myself. Yeah, I may be someone who is a perfectionist and want things done right, but I got a true heart behind it in wanting to see the best for our community and want it to really be something that will last for years and years to come. Richard Leather, thank you for an amazing year for Inside Leather History of Fireside Chat. Thank you, Dirk. <laughs>